All right, hello everyone. How are you doing this evening? Welcome to Black Minds Matter, a course where we seek to raise the national consciousness about issues facing black boys and men in education. My name is Luke Wood, and I will be guiding us through this evening. We are blessed to have two incredible scholars who are going to be joining us this evening, uh, Kimberly Griffin and Terrell Strayhorn, and they're gonna be talking about uh, these concepts that we're looking at, in particular this week, we're trying to link uh, campus climate issues and how that relates to non-cognitive outcomes. So we'll be really um, blessed to have the, the individuals for, uh, here today that we're going to have. Now, what I wanted to do, I actually had planned to talk about the third uh, wheel of the D3 effect, um, but I'm going to save that actually for next week instead. And in this week, in, uh, what we're going to do is focus on moving uh, campus and organizational cultures. We talked about this actually during the closed session with the students last week, but I thought I would share some of that during the, the large group session. But before that, something happened today that I felt was important to, to talk about just in terms of framing uh, the importance of this course and some of the things that are coming out of this course in terms of discussion uh, that's taking place in the scholarly realm. So before I do that, I want to just paint a picture about why it's important to talk about the topic of intelligence as it relates to our black boys and men. Okay, so we know uh, from the research that we've done that oftentimes our black boys and men are perceived as being academically incapable, inferior in, in terms of perception. And we talked about, we had a whole se section uh, that we did on descriptions of intelligence, looking at the different ways in which these messages manifest for them, where they are assumed to be, again, academically inferior. I wanted to show you a chart um, based upon a study that that we recently submitted to a journal uh, called, um, and is, what it's from is from the uh, Eccles K, which is an early childhood longitudinal data set. And what we're looking at in this data set is a variable uh, that deals with the perception of a teacher in kindergarten that children are incapable of learning. And so it's a, wonderful that the, the federal government actually asked this question. And what they do is they have different focal children who are who the teachers are responding to based upon that focal child. And so they ask questions about those children and their families to teachers. Uh, they ask it about the two, those same questions to school administrators. And in addition to that, they also ask uh, the, the teachers about the children in that class. So based upon the focal child in that class, we did an analysis looking at the percentage of the class that the, that the teachers believe were incapable of learning in kindergarten. And this is data that you can see from that analysis. And this is looking specifically at boys. And the higher the bar, the higher the percentage of teachers who believe that these children are incapable of learning. And there's different ways you can cut this analysis, but we look specifically at those who either agreed with that statement or strongly agreed with that statement. And what you find is this, is that in classrooms where there's a, uh, where the black child was the focal child for that survey, it's a higher percentage of educators who are reporting that the children in that classroom are incapable of learning in kindergarten. Just want to let that sit for a moment because I think it's really important for why we talk about some of these concepts that we're talking about in this course. And so informed by this perspective and informed by the, the scholarly research that I've conducted with my colleague, uh, Frank Harris III, as well as numerous contributions from the individuals who have been uh, uh, have made uh, guest lectures in this class or will make guest lectures in this class, based upon that knowledge, I provided a couple of weeks ago a critique of a concept called growth mindset. Now, the week before last when I did that, it was during our, ses our session on ascription of intelligence. The theory of growth mindset deals with neuroplasticity and how brains can change over time. Growth mindset is a motivational theory that's extended by a scholar named Darryl, Carol Dweck that focuses on ensuring that students do not see intelligence as a fixed trait, but as something that can be gained through hard work. In one of her examples, uh, Dweck notes that even when we look at individuals such as Mozart and Einstein, they still had to put years of effort into their practice to be able to be as excellent as they were. And thus, from a motivational theorist perspective, They've argued that emphasizing dedication and perseverance is the key to fostering mindsets that will inevitably promote students' uh, academic performance. 
the two concepts of a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset are juxtaposed in the research. And a fixed mindset is viewed, being, viewed as being bad. A fixed mindset is one that focuses on intelligence as being innate or people being smart because they're simply smart individuals. And it's purported that when this occurs, when people see a, have a fixed mindset that they're unwilling to make mistakes and they hide their deficiency and therefore it doesn't promote learning in the same way that a growth mindset would. Instead, a growth mindset is focused on growing and can, a student can essentially overcome setbacks that they might face. It's where students care about learning and effort is placed on positive, uh, on basically effort is viewed as a positive thing. And as in, in this quote, you can see it ignites their intelligence and causes them to grow. Now, I, I wanted to revisit this because uh, there's been some critique of, of my comments and I wanted to, to share some things that, that have occurred since then. So as part of the work that I do, I have the pleasure and honor of going across the country with my colleague, Frank, and talking to school leaders, to college educators, to administrators, and talking about concepts um, that influence success. And over the past few years, what I've seen is an expansive increase in the emphasis on the, of the concept of growth mindset. And what I become concerned about is even more so, not just the concept, but the application of the theory. Um, and it's been especially troublesome because of the research that I do on black boys and men. And the, the, the issue for me resolve, revolves around the fact that it places an effort or a focus rather on validating students' effort rather than validating their abilities. And here's a quote from um, Dr. Dweck. It says, we can praise wisely, not praising intelligence, we can praise wisely, not praising intelligence or talent. That has failed. Don't do that anymore. But praising the process that kids engage in, their effort, their strategies, their focus, their perseverance, their improvement. This process praises, this process praise creates kids who are hardy and resilient. So as noted in that session, I have significant concerns because what we're doing is we're telling um, individuals that it's important for us to focus on effort and not ability. And in my work on with looking at black males in community colleges in particular, what we find is that even at that point, we, when students get to that point, there's still sometimes uh, they've never been told that, you know, you have the ability to do this, I believe in you, to view them as being people who can be brilliant. And there's a long sociological reasons that we could look at in terms of why black men are socialized to perceive that they are academically inferior and why society and teachers help to reinforce those same notions. And so for me, it becomes problematic when we basically reinforce a theory that tells us don't validate their abilities to a group that may have never received those kinds of messages. And so as part of, of the, the course, um, we have been blessed in that the Huffington Post has been doing a regular blog contribution and series focusing on what are some of the things that come out of Black Minds Matter. And one of them uh, talked about this critique, um, though the, the, the title of the article is a little salacious in comparison to the actual comments that I made, um, which were that growth mindset in my mind is an incomplete theory in that when we're talking about black boys and men, it may not have full applicability. And here's one reason why I even see that in some of the work that I do, is that I have the, you know, the privilege of working with students at all levels, uh, students who are undergraduates, master's students, and doctoral students. And even then, it's not uncommon for me to, to engage with a student who's at the highest level of education, who is a black male, who has never been validated before. And when you tell them, hey, you know what, you're, you're brilliant, you have the ability to do this, and you give them those important messages, it's not uncommon for them to not even know how to receive that. For them to be, think about, oh, well, maybe they're trying to, maybe he's trying to schmooze me, is he being disingenuous? And to even receive it with a sense of suspicion. We see this oftentimes in the community college and we tell our faculty colleagues, you know, it's important for you if you validate a student and they rebuff that to continue to validate them because for a population that has never received these messages before, it's very important for you to continue doing so so you can help break down that barrier so they can begin to see themselves as individuals who are capable. And then of course, then that's where a growth mindset would of course come in where you then can also then focus on 
validating efforts. So what we were critiquing was this false dichotomy that sometimes plays out. So as an outgrowth of that, um, I was asked to come on to KPBS uh, this morning and to talk about some of the critique that we have of this theory as well as other theories that we've been talking about in this class. Growth mindset is, is certainly not the only one. And in response to that, uh, Dr. Dweck released a statement that I thought that I would read because I think it helps to demonstrate how uh, this course is in some ways promoting change in our field. She said, I welcome Dr. Wood's input and his deeply informed perspective. I had this very discussion with my undergraduate class. We agreed that some students, especially um, for those laboring under negative stereotypes about their ability, reassurance about ability can be an important thing. I believe in your ability to do this can be an important message. This, in, I believe in our field, is a, a monumental shift in terms of how uh, this concept has been portrayed. And I laud Dr. Dweck in, in really embracing a more holistic view, which I think is important because you can go to schools and colleges across the country and they'll say, well, we're a growth mindset school. And we embrace these concepts, but not necessarily recognizing that sometimes those concepts can do more damage than good. So having this more balanced perspective that we can validate both ability and validate effort, I think is very important. So from this um, whole experience, uh, I've learned a few things that I'd like to share with you. One uh, is about theories. We can't be afraid to point out the limitations of existing theories and practices. There's a number of individuals who were very unhappy with the statements that I made, um, but if we're ever going to change the patterns that we see in education, we have to be bold enough to say, and honest enough with one another to say that when things aren't working. Because ultimately, it's not about us, it's about the students that we're serving. The second point that I'd like to make is that theories such as student engagement, grit, challenge and support, and growth mindset are important, but they are incomplete when we're talking about our black boys and men. And therefore, it's, and it's necessary that when we're talking about this population or our other underserved students, for us to have a more holistic perspective about how we can support their learning development and success. The second level of comment that I would like to provide is really just a response to how Dr. Dweck approached this uh, critique of her work. I think that the way that she responded um, is exemplary and a model for how all of us should approach our work. She was open to critique from colleagues. She, as you can see in the, in the comments that she provided, listened to her own students. And I think her openness to critique, listening to students, and response is a model for how all of us can and should be as scholars and as educators. So what I'd like to do before we turn it over now to our um, special guest for the week is to go over a taxonomy that I shared with a class in person, but I think I'd like to share with the, the broader public class because I think it's important. And so what this taxonomy is, is on how to unveil professional development for individuals who are, um, who are being trained to better embrace teaching and learning for our historically underserved students, particularly for our men of color. And actually this came, comes out of the work uh, that Dr. Harris and I have been doing with the Center for Organizational Responsibility and Advancement in running large-scale professional development programming for those who teach and work with boys and men of color. And from that work in unveiling large-scale professional development, we've learned that there are some different populations and that we can't have a one-size-fits-all approach for professional development if we're truly going to change what needs to be changed. So I'll say this, there are a number of areas of professional development need when we're focusing on our black boys and men. Educators need to be trained in how to promote successful collaborative learning, how to develop personal relationships with students, how to express validating messages to students that validate effort and ability, of course, how to engage with students, and more importantly, how to welcome and create conditions that welcome invite and de demonstrate that their engagement is desired both inside the classroom and outside the classroom. How to engage in appropriate disclosing of their own, of, own uh, of challenges that they may have faced as well. 
how to empower students through their teaching practice, how to be intrusive, how to express authentic care for students, how to convey high expectations, because as I said before, no one has ever risen to low expectations, how to engage in performance monitoring, how to embrace the concept of institutional responsibility, and understanding of microaggressions, culturally relevant teaching, and unconscious bias. For any school, college, or university, that is the recipe for success. It's professional development in all of those areas. And it's, you know, fortunately, Dr. Harris and myself have the privilege of leading a lot of trainings that focus on these topics. And there's others that do so as well. But if we're going to do that, we have to recognize that a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work. And we have a taxonomy that we use that helps to explain the different populations and how those different populations approach uh, professional development programming. So let me, let me start by saying this. It's not uncommon for us to be invited out to come to a campus, and we're there to talk about racial microaggressions for men of color. And the campus has been real excited. They're galvanized. They've got the, everybody's on board. We're going to come and we're going to have these individuals come on our campus. And, and so they set aside a, a time during noon and they, maybe they provide some, some food for people who are going to come. And then Dr. Harris and I get there and 30 people show up out of a campus of several thousand individuals. And the 30 people who showed up were the people who already knew what microaggressions were. And when the campus created it in mind, they had very specific people in mind who they wanted to be there. They're like, well, Jerry and Sally, we really need them here. But guess who doesn't show up? Jerry and Sally, right? Why? Because we have a one-size-fits-all approach that doesn't reach the populations that it's designed to reach. So what we found in our work is that there are two primary characteristics of those who um, who are engaged in this work, and those characteristics create four different populations, and in reality, those four populations require different interventions to reach them. So if you're gonna roll out a year-long, two-year-long professional development regimen to reach the people who really wanna be reached, you have to re realize that there are two distinctive characteristics. First, individuals who know what to do, and second, individuals who have a willingness to actually do it. So it's not just knowing, but it's also the willingness to employ those practices. Now that creates four different groups as you can see on your screen. Those in the top right, the KW group, those are those who know what to do and are willing to do it. The, K, the DKW, DKU, and KU. Four different groups. So let's start with the ones on the top right hand side. These are individuals who both know what to do and they have a willingness to do it. Now, usually when we go to campuses, we say, hey, so what would you call this group? And some people will say, well, they're advocates. Some people would say they're champions. Some people jokingly say unicorns because they're hard to find. In reality, and in our work, we call them the choir. The choir are the individuals who know what to do and they have a willingness to do it. If there's a professional development training on teaching boys and men of color, on unconscious bias, stereotype threat, microaggressions, any of those topics that I mentioned, these are the individuals who are going to come. No matter what, if it's a noon program, with food or without food, it's an evening program, sometimes some colleges have weekend programs, these are the individuals who are gonna show up. Why? Because they are passionate about addressing issues for this population. The second group are the allies. What separates the allies from the choir is knowledge. The allies don't necessarily know what to do, but they have a willingness to do it. So the bridge for them is knowledge. So what we want to do with them is to provide them with information on, on how to do these practices so that they can then be transition to becoming members of the choir. In addition to that, there's two other group. There's another group called the resistors. And what we do is we actually break the resistors down into two different groups, active resistors and passive resistors. Active resistors actively resist. Again, for resistors, they don't know what to do and they have an unwillingness to do it. So you can even call them the don't know, don't care group. With active resistors, if they hear that Frank and I are coming to do a professional development training on men of color, 
Maybe one of them will send an email out to the entire campus telling them that they shouldn't come to the training, that it's an example of reverse discrimination or reverse racism. Maybe a department chair will hold a faculty meeting at the exact same time to prevent faculty members, faculty members in their department from going. Those aren't made up scenarios. Those are true examples of what's happened before. Active resistors are vocal and they are visible. But most people aren't active resistors, they're passive resistors. Passive resistors just want to stay out of the fray. They hear that we're coming, they're not going to say anything, they're not going to raise a stink about it. You know what they're going to do? They're just not going to come. They're not going to show up because they passively resist. And unfortunately on many of our campuses, that's one of the groups that we really need to reach and we have a hard time reaching them. Why? Because they're, they're passively resisting and they just, they, they basically vote with their lack of presence. The last group that we want to pay attention to is the defiant. The defiant are those who have been exposed to training and development opportunities, but willfully choose not to change their practice. It's willful defiance. They've been trained on microaggressions. They know what they are. They've been trained in unconscious bias. They know what that is. They've learned strategies for teaching underserved students, but they willfully choose not to do anything about it. And so what we have to recognize is if we're going to unveil a movement on our campuses or our schools to change outcomes for men of color, we can't do a one size fits all approach because there's different populations with different motivations. We also have to recognize that there's a different breakdown than we might typically have in our mind. Here's a percentage breakdown that we see in the work that we do. Oftentimes when I go to campuses and I ask about active resistors, most people think that active resistors account for a large population of people, but in reality they don't. They only account for about 10% of the population, but you know what? They're a vocal and visible 10%. In the work that we've done, we've reached out to equity coordinators across campuses that we partner with to ask them, what is the percentage breakdown in your campus? And this is what they say. About 15% are the choir, 30% are allies, 30% past resistors, 10% active resistors, and 15% defiant. So if we're going to unveil a professional development regimen, we've got to keep in mind that there are different groups with different motivations. So here's a chart that we use. If you are in front of your computer right now, take a picture of this chart. This is what we believe is the key to success, and it deals with what we call the three E's. The three E's are empower, educate, and encourage. With the choir, what we want to do is we still want to reach them. If we're going to hold a professional development program on our campus or professional development training, we still want to reach members of the choir. Why? Because they can still benefit from them. We want to empower them right, with additional strategies and practices. They may know a lot, they may be doing a lot, but sometimes they need more tools. And in addition, sometimes they just need some reassurance that they're on the right track. But if you're gonna reach them, you have to recognize that it's probably a lot easier to do so because your delivery in terms of reaching them can be voluntary and it can be flexible. You can send them flyers, you can send them emails, and they're gonna show up. They're always gonna show up. Why? Because they have an intrinsic commitment to the population. The second group are the allies. Again, what separates them from the choir is a lack of information. Typically, they're motivated by issues of social justice and educational equity. They're passionate, maybe not about men of color because they don't necessarily know what to do with that, but they're passionate about social justice. So you know what you do is you provide them with the information so they can become members of the choir. So because they may not have the direct intrinsic commitment to say black boys and black men, what you wanna do is recognize that you're gonna to have to leverage their focus on social justice and educational equity. So your delivery system in terms of reaching out to them can be voluntary and flexible, but it needs to be a little bit more convenient than it would be for the choir. Now, what we recommend is this. Host a training on your campus for teaching boys of color or for microaggressions or unconscious bias. The choir is going to come. At the end of the training, give them a list and have them write down three people in their own departments who they believe would come and support these efforts. Those are your lists to start out with who might be the allies. And then what you know what you do is you then are intrusive about encouraging them to come to the next session so that our fold begins to increase and grow out and become much bigger each time we have a new session. So with them, you want to do direct referrals, phone calls, email follow-ups, 
again, it can be voluntary, but it might need to be a little bit more flexible. Now, with those who are the passive resistors, we have to remember passive resistors do what? They passively resist. So if you invite them to a training, they're not going to come. So what you have to do is you have to meet them at places and spaces that they're already going to be. Department meetings, all faculty day, convocations, mandatory meetings are where you have to reach them. And with them, our goal is to encourage them. And specifically, we want to encourage them to care. Because if we can get them to care, then we can get them to employ the strategies and practices that are necessary for this population. You have to be with this population intrusive and direct. Again, going to places and spaces that they have to be. And you also have to recognize that the motivation for them is not intrinsic. And it's not based upon educational equity and social justice. It's based upon tangible things that they can hold that they can see. Compliance, funding, organizational priority, recognition, release time, retention, tenure, and promotion. Tangible things that they can see and hold on to. Having the classroom that they want. Tangible things. Those have to be the carrots that we use to eventually get them to move into becoming members of the allies and then hopefully members of the choir. Now with the last two groups, the active resistors and the defiant, our goal with them is to redirect them. Some people have jokingly said, well, the goal with them really should be to eliminate them. Really, it should be the four E's. But in reality, that's not what we want to do because ultimately what we want is to have them come on board with the rest of us and to become equity oriented. And you know what? Some people will. It just takes a little bit more time. So what we want to do is redirect them to engage in activities where they can still contribute to the campus mission, to the school mission, to what we're trying to accomplish, but maybe in a way that allows them to do it in a way that is really what they're more comfortable with. So it's a little bit of time waiting to reach them, but ultimately what we want to do is create an environment where eventually they can't be comfortable being active resistors or members of the Defiant. I wanted to provide a little bit more insight of what you might do with this population. First, what they need, those active resistors and defiant, once you've carried out, say, a year-long professional development intervention where you've reached the choir, you brought people from the allies into the choir, and people from the past resistors into the allies into the choir, once you've done that, then your focus should be on the active resistors and the defiant. And what you need to do is this. You need to provide enhanced exposure to people who are equity-minded. People are social creatures. They have to be around other individuals who have different mindsets, and over time, people can change. And I also want to make sure I give a shout out to my, my colleague, uh, Sua Zhong, who helped me um, this morning with some of these points. Increased intensity and longevity of professional development. A one-time professional development, two-time professional development training is not enough. It has to be intensive. It has to be ongoing. The third thing is we need to break up clusters of resistance and defiance. What we find oftentimes is they, they end up, let's say that this is a larger campus, right? They end up being clustered in these certain departments in certain areas. Well, you know what we have to do? We have to break up these clusters so that they're more exposed to people who are not necessarily uh, espousing the same ideologies and beliefs that they, systems that they have. The other thing that you'll find is that sometimes you'll have people what we call isolated holdouts. It'll be one person over here who comes, they do their class, they come, they do their thing, and then they go out, and they don't really get involved with the rest of what the campus is doing. They're isolated, and they're kind of holdouts to this work. Well, what we have to do with those isolated holdouts is we have to reintegrate them into the rest of the environment. And by doing that, again, we provide them with more exposure to people who might think differently than them. Lastly, and this is not ideal, but in some cases, we may need to temporarily reassign people to posts where they have more limited exposure to students because if they're doing harm, we can't allow that to continue to take place. Again, this is not ideal, and it's really kind of a last uh, effort, but it is something that we sometimes might have to do. Now, lastly, we have to recognize that in terms of change theory, um, and especially uh, work from, um, from, from looking in, in biology and in environmental studies, they say that there's three responses to environmental change when you have animals in a certain environment. I think it applies very much to organizational change as well. That you can either, as a, if, it, if you're an animal, right, and the environment is changing, you have three options. You can either move, you can adapt, or you can die. Now, 
in an organizational context, right, we can apply those and make changes in terms of how it might still apply. So moving might be leaving. For some individuals, ultimately, they'll recognize that it's just not a good fit and they'll leave the institution. And that's unfortunate because we've lost somebody who could ultimately eventually help to contribute. But if it's protecting our students, it's sometimes the necessary thing. The second thing is that they can adapt. They can change. And people do change. I've had people tell me, Luke, after seeing this taxonomy, I was an active resistor. I was a defiant. I was a passive resistor. And I, I, and I can't say that I've changed, but I feel like I'm changing. People have said that. So I know that it takes place. We have to believe in, in people's ability to be able to come better when provided with the opportunity to do so. And in some cases, and this is why I would say is again not ideal, in, in a very extreme case, you might have to make the decision if you're an administrator that this is not a good fit and to separate um, linkages with that individual. Again, that's not ideal, but sometimes it does have to take place. So with that, um, I want to turn it over to our, our guest speakers. We have two wonderful guest speakers who are going to be joining us today. And I'm going to switch it over. Our first guest speaker is uh, Kimberly Griffin. And I'm going to uh, read her bio here to you and um, so we can get going and, and have the opportunity to hear from her. So Kron, if you can go ahead and, and bring her up while I read her bio, that would be great. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Can you hear us? I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. And we can see you as well. So uh, Kimberly A. Griffin is an associate professor at the University of Maryland. Prior to becoming a faculty member, she served as a higher education administrator and student affairs professional, working in undergraduate and graduate admissions, promoting diverse and hospitable learning environments and new student orientation. Professor Griffin is a recognized scholar in the area of higher education access and equity research. Throughout her career, she has contributed to multiple projects that examine the diverse experiences of black students and faculty, the impact of campus climate, and how mentoring relationships influence student and faculty success. Much of her work focuses on exploring efforts to increase diversity in the professoriate. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Griffin. Hi. Dr. Griffin, thank you so much for, for joining us. We truly appreciate your time. Oh, it's my uh, pleasure. Yeah, it, it's really good to see you and it's really good to ha have you um, on Black Minds Matter. I know that there's many people who are very excited uh, to hear from you. Uh, but for those who might not be as familiar with your work at, as I am and as some others are, can you tell them a little bit about the research that you do in general? Sure. So um, I generally consider myself an, an access and equity and higher education researcher, but I guess specific to the conversations we're having tonight, um, I do a lot of research related to campus racial climate. And I understand climate as attitudes, behaviors, feelings, um, how people really experience an environment when it comes to issues related to diversity, inclusion, um, particularly around race and ethnicity. So I have to acknowledge that I had the wonderful opportunity to learn and train with folks at the University of Maryland and at UCLA. So uh, Walter Allen and Sylvia Hurtado and Jeff Milam. Um, I didn't get the chance to work with Alma Clayton Pedersen, but um, they really De they developed this foundational model of campus racial climate that has informed my work um, for my whole career. And it's, it's really been transformational for me to think about how people of color generally, but, but black people in particular, experience climate. Um, so often we have these simplistic notions that when folks are in a challenging climate, very similar to um, what you just shared, uh, Luke, that people either adapt or they leave or they die, right? Um, but that there are these multiple forms that, of, of resistance, that there are these multiple ways that people experience a climate and that ultimately they may, over a long period of time, experience some kind of decline in their outcomes, um, some, feel a lack of a sense of belonging, um, not really reach their fullest potential because of the challenging climates that they experience. And, and that's really the work that I focus on and that I like to do. Um, so just a couple examples of how I've thought about climate. Um, I've looked at how high achieving black students and then black faculty experience climate on campus um, and how they engage in acts of resistance. I've explored within group diversity, so I've thought about how um, black students from immigrant backgrounds or who have strong ethnic identities perceive and experience climate and how that might look similar and different to black students who have longer histories in the United States. 
Um, and I've thought about black students, particularly in STEM, and how they think about the racial climate and the disciplinary climate in STEM and how that might lend to them feeling a sense of belonging and identity as a scientist and also intentions to, to be an academic. So thank you so much. It, you know, I know you do wonderful research. I don't, I'll, I'll say this to you, it might be a little weird to listen, listen to me say this to you, but what I would consider to be the best scholarly presentation I've ever seen in my life was one that you gave um, at, oh. at Association for the Study of Higher Education. Oh, so thank you. I always admire the work that you do. Thank you. That means so much to me. So um, how do, in terms of, because you, you mentioned that, that you do work on, on, on campus environments and, and black students, how do black men and then also maybe just black students in general encounter our college environments? What, what is the research telling us? Sure. So um, I'm going to start with a little bit um, of an anecdote. So I'm, I'm sure everybody in your audience and everybody watching remembers what happened a couple of years ago at the University of Missouri that um, students were protesting because of all of the, the, the hostile and challenging things that they were experiencing on campus, from racial slurs to um, questions in the classroom that questioned their validity and um, their representation in that space, the things um, that were posted on residence hall walls that, you know, that there were all these things that were happening to these students. And so, you know, I'm sure, Luke, you got a lot of these phone calls, too, of um, reporters who wanted us to speak to, you know, oh, why is this happening now? And is this new? And um, why are we seeing all of this happen now? And I think my response and the response of others was that this isn't new. We have 40 years of research by people like Walter Allen and Sean Harper, um, Sharon Brees Britt, Terrell Strayhorn, who's going to speak shortly, um, Caroline Turner, Lori Patton Davis, all these people have done work for years and years that tell us that Black students generally and black men in particular um, really experience college campuses often as hostile places um, that that's not true for every single person and that there are some campuses that are doing some really really encouraging and affirming work um, really creating communities of inclusion but you know more often than not we hear both in practice but but in the research we hear about students being assumed to be incompetent or not belonging in classrooms um, experiencing microaggressions around their level of academic ability, questions about whether or not they were an affirmative action admit, are they as smart as everybody else, um, which can trigger some, some desire to prove, um, which can be both motivational and problematic at the same time. And we can talk about that more later. Um, also, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, actually, can you mention why that might be both motivational and problematic? Sure, so um, I think when you hear that, right, that, oh, you're not as good as everybody else, that your natural response might be like, well, I'm going to prove you wrong. I, I'm, I'm going to be just as good or better than everybody else. Um, so while that might feel like it's motivational, at the same time, it's taking energy away from the actual task at hand. Um, and, and that's essentially what the stereotype threat hypothesis is, is saying, that if you test somebody on something, while they may feel motivated when you trigger a stereotype about their group, that energy that they're taking to think through the how I'm going to disprove this stereotype and I really need to get it together and I need to focus and I really need to do well to prove something to somebody actually distracts you from the task, task and you perform less well. Um, and that over time, that need to prove or the feeling of the need to prove yourself to other people becomes tiring. Um, nobody wants to do that into perpetuity and that ultimately it, that might lead you to decide that you don't want to be in that space anymore. And that could be very damaging. Yeah. So are we seeing more emerging issues around campus climate, do you think? Are, are there, because I mean, obviously, in terms of the national climate, there's some things that are, that are obviously are taking place and have taken place, such as Charlottesville, the elections, a number of things. Are we seeing some emerging issues? And if so, how does that affect students? Sure. I, I, I don't think that we're, I think we're seeing more in the sense through social media, um, that stu students are making their experiences more visible in a way that they haven't been able to before, that our current political climate is emboldening folks to say things that maybe they said behind closed doors before, that they feel like they can say them out in public now. Um, but again, I don't know that this is anything transformational or, or fundamentally new. Um, the, the things, though, that I, I think that students are being challenged by in terms of climate kind of fall into four big chunks. And um, they're all interrelated with one another, but I'll, I'll do my best to talk about them separately. So the first 
big chunk or the big, first big piece of climate is really just the persistent underrepresentation that we see in campus communities. Um, that when we have so few African American students, black men on college and university campuses, it, it's a struggle to have critical mass. And when you don't see yourself in the student body um, the way that you should, um, it just feels like you may not belong there. It feels like, you know, I'm standing out here all by myself, that I have something to prove, um, that you're both very visible um, in terms of making mistakes and, and feeling um, that level of discomfort, but also invisible in terms of some of your concerns and needs because you might feel like you're such a minority. Um, I think there's a behavioral piece to climate as well. Um, it, the UCLA um, and the Higher Education Research Institute um, does a freshman survey every year, um, as I'm sure many of folks in the audience know. And I always find the question um, that's asked of, of freshmen, how confident do you feel in engaging across difference? How comfortable do you feel engaging other people who are different than yourself to be really interesting? Because first year students are very confident in their ability to do this, right? Like about 80% of students will say, I'm very confident. You know, I, I certainly am going to be able to engage people that are different than myself. But, you know, when we think about the realities that these folks are growing up in, that, um, you know, our school districts are more segregated than they were in the 1960s, and these students are coming to campuses with a high degree of com confidence, but very little experience engaging across difference. We see students having really difficult engagements um, across difference. We see black students encountering white students, students from other racial and ethnic backgrounds that have never encountered black students before, and having really, really difficult interactions that can be marked by stereotypes and microaggressions and racism, um, and that these things keep coming up. And I think it's even more problematic and difficult because folks feel more confident than they should about their ability to engage. Um, there's a structural piece, um, policies and programs um, that are focused on black students that continue to keep um, black students and black men in particular at the margins rather than at the center. So when we think about how we think about bringing equity or inclusion into the curriculum, um, we have conversations about diversity requirements, um, having folks take one course. Um, what would it mean to intentionally weave um, inclusion and diversity and diverse perspectives throughout the curriculum? Um, shouldn't everybody have the opportunity to learn about African American history or African American culture rather than you know, black students largely choosing those classes in African American studies and having it be a one-off experience for some students. And then finally, I think all of these different pieces fit together to the psychological piece of climate. Um, so whether or not, again, you feel um, belonging or fit, um, a sense that this is a place for you or it's not a place for you, is it a place where you feel welcome? Is it a place where you feel like you're expected to succeed? Um, and not feeling that can make you feel like you don't want to stay at that institution or you somehow psychologically disengage um, from the institution. And I, I think that this particularly, you know, we can think about academic outcomes, but I think a lot about well-being. I think a lot about um, that sense of belonging piece and, and particularly thinking about well-being, thinking about our students who are now so actively engaged in campus activism and that are pushing for change in campus communities that um, there's going to be this wave of research, I feel like, coming out over the next couple years, really looking at students who have been engaging in activism and pushing for change and what implications that has on them, on their well-being, on their sense of belonging, on their ability to really um, become their best selves in, in an academic sense. Yeah, that would be really interesting to see how that plays out. So what are some of the ways that educators and administrators can create environments that are supportive of black collegians, particularly for black males. I mean, what are, you, you've done work on this for a number of years now. What, what, what can they actually do? Sure, so I, I think we can always talk about um, structural pieces and policies and programs, but um, I'm more and more convinced that, you know, structures and policies and programs are also reliant on individuals to actually embody those policies and programs and um, be mindful of how they're working with black students and black men. Um, I've done some writing about other mothering and um, it's a concept that I borrowed from Doug Guifrida and it's a concept that he borrowed from, you know, a legacy of work on fictive kinship in the black community, um, from studies of slavery, um, that, you know, or, and the whole notion that it takes a village to raise a child, right? That 
um, an individual is not just raised by their biological parents, that there are these other people in your life that you may not have blood relation to who are very invested in you, who are there to help cultivate you and, and help really bring about your best outcomes. So um, uh, Dr. Guafrida wrote about these ideas first, um, or before I did, um, in his paper where he was talking to black students about who they sought out for help and support. And they described people that had these qualities of other mothers consistent with this framework and that so often these individuals were black faculty members. And then um, in some of the work that I did on black faculty in talking about how they engage with black students, they, they described the same qualities and the same ideas. So I think the extent to which we can kind of apply some of these principles that other mothers um, apply we can see more traction, we can see more supportive environments and climates. So I'll, I'll very quickly give you some of them. So one of them is it's a care and concern that is deep and goes beyond just, hey, I want you to perform well in my class. Um, this care about like, who are you growing into, an emphasis on holistic development, like really holistically caring about a student. Um, this is so in line with what you were sharing earlier, Luke. Um, a belief in a student's ability and capacity to be great. Um, just a real firm knowledge that this student has all the potential in the world um, and really believing in them and making sure that you are clearly communicating to that student that you believe in them. And then the final piece is um, a bit of tough love that uh, mentorship is not always, I always tell my students, mentorship is not kittens and rainbows all the time. Um, and it's not always just affirmation and telling someone how great they are. Um, that sometimes it takes time and effort and trust in a relationship to really push someone to fulfill their potential rather than just um, giving them a pass um, and letting them go. Um, and just to really hang in there with that student and to do the work and really push them to, to really be their best self. So I think to the extent that we could get more student affairs professionals, more faculty members, um, more institutional leaders to think about how can we be other mothers to students? How can we really embody these principles to, to help develop them fully that we might get a little bit more traction? Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because if I think about my own experience, other mothering and other fathering have been absolutely essential. When I, when I went off to college, um, you know, my parents had never had the opportunity to go to college, so they didn't know how they could support me other than, you know, saying, hey, how's it going and checking in. Mm -hmm. And so when I first went, there was a, a black woman, and I, unfortunately to this day I can't, I cannot remember her name, but she took me and my brother underneath her wing. I remember like we were students who struggled with food insecurity. She would, you know, take us to go out and eat with her, check in on us, encourage us, motivate us, hold us accountable. Like you said, it's not always rosy. Um, and I, do, I, mean, I used to say that she's, you know, you know, like a mom away from home. And then I think about um, as I got farther in my academic career, uh, there was a, a faculty member at Sac State, his name was Cecil Canton, and the interesting thing is I never took a single class from him. I saw him one day on campus, and he said, hi, black man, how are you doing? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> every time you saw another, another brother on campus, you acknowledged their presence, right? And, and he went, I mean, if I was hosting an organizational event, he was there. He was always, you know, calling to check on us, sending us an email, just showing up and, and being supportive all the time. And again, I never took a single class with him, but probably one of the most impactful mentors I've ever had in my entire life. Yeah, so absolutely. Show how powerful that can be. Mm -hmm. So um, next I'd like to do is actually transition to focusing a little bit more on the work that you do on faculty of color. Uh -huh. what, are, what are some of the challenges that our faculty of color face and how does, do, do those challenges affect students, if at all? Sure. Um, so I, when I initially started my research on um, black faculty members, I think one of the things that was really compelling to me and, and made me think that, gosh, I, I not only want to study black faculty, but black faculty in relationship to black students was that from everything I knew, their, their experiences were pretty parallel. So becoming a faculty member doesn't mean that you get to escape the same um, pathologies that affect you when you're, you're a student. So um, decades of research tell us that um, black faculty members are often presumed, again, incompetent and have to prove themselves, um, particularly in terms of teaching and in terms of research, so that often they're assumed to be not experts, not as smart, 
um, again, an affirmative action hire. So certainly that there was someone more qualified that, um, that they replaced in terms of hiring. Um, and particularly if they do research that relates to communities of color or that's, you know, quote unquote, me search, so is, is connected to their own identities that they have to justify that, you know, well, this is certainly rigorous, this is certainly important, that it's not at the margins, that's not just navel gazing in ways that their colleagues who also might be engaging in, in um, me search don't have to do. Um, the same kind of pieces around a racism that makes you highly visible and also invisible at the same time that your, your concerns might be ignored when you bring up how your students might challenge you in the classroom or people may not perceive themselves as engaging in microaggressions against you. Um, but at the same time, everything you do feels like it's under a, a spotlight. Um, I, also, similar themes around feeling isolated and marginalized and having a lack of critical mass, um, particularly when we look at how trends have or, and probably more accurately, have not changed in the last 40 years in terms of faculty diversity, that um, progress has been extremely slow and that we've made a lot more progress in terms of undergraduate um, diversity and even in graduate education than we have in the professoriate. I'd say the thing that is somewhat unique about faculty of color um, and, and that ties them into their um, relationships with students in some ways is workload um, and the conversation around workload and faculty members of color that um, there's this weird balance of having this commitment to community that often brought you to the academy. So an interest and an investment for many faculty members of color, not, not for everyone certainly, but in working with community in mentoring students and training the next generation to really reaching back um, so there's that commitment that leads you to say yes to service more, um, but at the same time you're asked to do more. Um, if you're not interested in that type of work that you may still be expected to engage in it, that you may be asked to be, you know, the quote unquote diversity representative on whatever search committee or campus committee that's, um, that's available so that you're in some ways visible as, you know, adding diversity to any and every community on campus. There are expectations from students. Um, that, that leads you to have this workload um, that's often heavier and unrecognized by your colleagues. Um, the ways that this affects black students. Um, I think that students watch us closely um, and seeing the lives of faculty members of color can make students feel a, reluctant to reach out to us at times because we have this culture and perception of busyness and taxation that might make students feel like they're going to be a burden when in fact that's probably the most, some of the most life affirming work that I do. Um, I think it may also create an image of being an academic that is not terribly appealing and that might turn several students of color and, and black students in particular away from their desire to be academics. Um, and I think, you know, it really pushes us to think critically about what does it mean to you know, tap a tapped resource. How are we being intentional about really rewarding and affirming and validating the faculty members who are choosing to do this work and, and work closely with students? Um, you know, what do students lose if faculty members of color aren't retained? So, in terms of what you've learned from your research, what are some things that you think that a faculty member who may not identify as a faculty of color what are, what are some things that they do that other faculty might consider doing to better support our, our black students? Yeah, I think, you know, when, when we think about, um, I, I promise you this is going, all going to come together and make sense. When we think about um, what students of color and, and black students in particular are asking for when they issue their list of demands and they often ask to see, you know, more faculty of color or more black faculty on college and university campuses, that that, that, that is what they're demanding. Um, what is that really about? And I think some of it is about, you know, having role models and being able to see yourself in the academy. But I think some of it is about the fact that, you know, it's often these faculty members who really show up for them, who support them, who understand their stories, who don't ask them to explain themselves, that believe in them. So really thinking about how can we translate some of these behaviors, some of these um, these affirmations and these sources of support that black students are finding in faculty members of color and, and make that just good mentoring practice, making that good practice when we engage with students. So how do we think about, you know, encouraging, you know, faculty of color, but also, 
you know, our majority colleagues, our white faculty members to really think about like, so, you know, what are my, you know, implicit and sometimes explicit biases about black and brown students and what they can do? Um, what are the stereotypes that I have been um, really relying on and using to drive my interactions with students and how am I showing up for them? Um, do I believe students when they tell me that they're experiencing these things on these on our campuses? Um, and can I step out of myself and whether or not I've personally experienced that to really be present for a student and let them share their story and let them feel safe and validated in doing so? Um, are you balancing that belief in their ability um, and belief in their potential with also holding them to those high expiration or high expectations, excuse me, that you mentioned earlier, Luke, and really encouraging them to like, hey, I know you can do it. Let's really push you to do your very best work. Let's make sure that you're trained really, really well to do exceptional work, not just work that will just get you by because I don't expect all that much from you. So I think it's really translating some of the things we know that work in terms of listening, being open, validating, motivating, and pushing, and really encouraging all faculty to adopt that as good practice. Thank you so much. So uh, what I'd like to do now is to go do and open it up for a, a few questions for you. Um, so because there, there are a number of people who want to ask you questions, if you, if you might just take them briefly uh, so we can sure. get through a few of them at least. And if you want to, uh, you can use the hashtag Black Minds Matter. And also um, you can reach Kim at, uh, at STEM PhD Careers. So Dr. Griffin is at STEM PhD Careers. So the first question comes from uh, Terry, who's a student in the physical class. He says, given the research, would black students be better served attending HBCUs um, and black children attending independent schools at the K-12 level? Oh, that's such a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> right, beginning of the game. You know. Ooh, you're going to start with a whopper. Um, you know, I, I posed this question in our campus environments class. I teach a class on different institutional types. Um, and when we, whenever we talk about HBCUs and we talk about the really positive outcomes that come out of those spaces, when we talk about the centering of students and, and black students and black history and black culture in those spaces, um, you know, I think at the end of class, I always ask like, so should we require all black students to go to HBCUs? Would that really be the best thing? And I think, no, um, we shouldn't require all black students to go to HBCUs. And that's not necessarily the best thing for every black student. I think that there are some really powerful practices that HBCUs engage in that institutions that don't center um, black students should be mindful of in terms of creating more inclusive environments. So that a lot of the things that we've discussed today about other mothering, um, intrusive in advising and intrusive practices that Luke mentioned earlier, the things that we know work for, for students, um, particularly for black students, how do we recreate those things in predominantly white environments so that students feel like they can have connection wherever they decide to go? That there are certain um, opportunities, there's certain accessibility issues that might lead students to choose institutions that aren't HBCUs. Not every black student feels like that's the environment that they want to be in. However, how can we make sure that they're in an inclusive and affirming environment wherever they decide to go? Absolutely. Next question comes from uh, Stacy Teeters, who's a student in the physical class. Uh, what can ally educators do to better support their colleague educators of color, especially recognizing that the service and mentorship expectations and pressures for these faculty members are very high? Yeah, um, I'd say two things. One, amplify, amplify, amplify. Like really make sure that your colleagues are recognized for this heavy lifting that they're doing, that so often there's nowhere to put it. There's nowhere to talk about the number of hours or the emotional energy that you're investing in cultivating your community and connecting to your community. So um, from your positions of, of power or even from positions of support, really affirming how important the work is, how critical it is to the missions of colleges and universities that if we want to serve students in the ways that we say that we're going to, that this type of work is the exact kind of work that everybody needs to be doing and that needs to be rewarded and supported. And I think the second piece is just picking up the mantle and, and doing that work too, not always feeling like 
if you have a student that comes to you, if a, if a black male student comes to you, surely you can't help them. They need another black male to, to mentor them, that you can do powerful work with them and support them, um, that it's really important for folks to have role models so that they can see themselves in the academy, but not all of our mentors need to share our identities, that you can still have a powerful impact on somebody else. Absolutely. Next question comes from uh, Caroline Lopez. Dr. Caroline Lopez, she says, um, how are we being intentional about rewarding and validating faculty members who's work, um, who work closely with students of color? What do students lose if faculty of color aren't retained? Um, I would argue we're not. Um, I don't think that we're being intentional about how we reward and how we validate faculty members who engage in this work. Um, you know, I, I don't think that we're really thinking about the time and the energy and the commitment um, and the ways that faculty members of color are often really holding up the diversity mission of many of our institutions or the inclusion mission of institutions. I think that we can do it better by thinking about how do we work that into tenure and promotion processes? How do we actually give folks, you know, awards and support and resources to do that work? Um, at some point, do you have enough mentees and are you engaging in enough community work that that's equivalent to a course that you're teaching? Um, is that a certain track that you could follow that would lead you to promotion? Um, that different faculty make different contributions to institutions. So I think it's really important for us to think critically about how we're recognizing and rewarding faculty members who do that work, but I, don't, I would say that we don't right now. Okay. Uh, we're going to take one more question, but before then, here's a comment from uh, Serrano who says, Dr. Kimberly Griffin has me snapping with my fist <laughs> up right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. So the last question is, is from Valencia Collette who says, uh, what, research, what climate research instruments would Dr. Griffin re recommend that cover the various uh, climate dimensions? Sure. So um, there are several folks who are doing really, really good climate work. So I don't want to, to give too much publication or too much publicity to any one person, but there are so many people who are doing great climate assessment work. So the Higher Education Research Institute has instruments that align um, with several of the dimensions that I talked about today. Um, Sean Harper's group um, at USC has great climate tools that they're, they're using. Um, Sam Eusaeus is doing really good work around culturally engaging environments, so moving from a discussion about climate to culture. Um, and then um, Sue Rankin also is doing great work, um, and she thinks about climate really holistically. So today we've talked mostly about race and ethnicity, but she does really, really comprehensive work thinking about um, climate from multiple perspectives from multiple marginalized populations. Um, and I think that there'll be increasingly really exciting work coming from my own institution, um, the Center um, for Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Education at the University of Maryland, um, that will be doing a lot of climate work, really helping institutions engage in, in change and really understanding their environment. So there's lots of different options um, and lots of different ways that you can connect to people who are doing climate work in a way that speaks to the needs of your institution. Thank you so much, Dr. Griffin. As, as expected, the comments were amazing. We truly appreciate your time. No, it was a pleasure. It was absolutely a pleasure. If I could leave with one last thought, if you are going to engage in climate assessment, I'm totally stealing this from Sean Harper. Do not do it and think that you've done your work. Make sure that you actually put it into practice and develop intervention and strategies, um, particularly consistent with what you shared earlier, Luke, that actually can make change in your campus community. Absolutely. Well, let's give her a round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Griffin. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much for doing this, Luke. It's so important. So now we're going to transition to our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Terrell Strayhorn. Dr. Strayhorn is a professor and founder CEO of Do Good Work Educational Consulting, LLC. Most recently, he was on the faculty at The Ohio State University, where he also served as the director of the Center for Higher Education Enterprise, CHI, and founding director of the Center for Ideas within the College of Education and Human Ecology. An internationally recognized student success scholar, highly acclaimed public speaker, and award-winning writer, Strayhorn is author of 10 books and over 200 book chapters and journal articles and other scholarly publications. He has given hundreds of invited keynotes and lectures at more than 500 universities and conferences across, across the globe. Dr. Strayhorn maintains an active and highly visible research agenda focused on major policy issues in education, student success, and achievement, 
issues of race, equity, and diversity, impact of college on students and student learning and development. His most popular book, College Students' Sense of Belonging, a key to educational success, has sold record copies nationally and just moved into its second edition, which will be released in 20 of 18. I will be one of the first individuals to buy that book and hopefully get Dr. Strayhorn to sign it. <laughs> So with that, we'd like to, to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Strayhorn. Thank you for joining us. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see you very well. For those who might be interested in beginning to post uh, questions for Dr. Strayhorn, his uh, Twitter handle is at TLS or TL Strayhorn, at TL Strayhorn, uh, and you can start to reach him there. Also, please use the hashtag Black Minds Matter. Well, good evening. Good evening. And thank you, Luke, for having me uh, join the class. This has been a really exciting experience to watch the course unfold each and every week. And um, my hat's off to you. Kudos for the great work you're doing at San Diego State University to really bring attention to um, a really important set of questions that I think we need to answer in society and certainly need to answer in education. So um, my, the plan is to sort of talk through a few slides to share some thoughts that I think map on to things that uh, Dr. Griffin, round of applause again for Dr. Griffin for that wonderful presentation she just gave, um, but to accent a couple of the points that she's making and then to stop and uh, make time for any questions from those in the audience or the listening audience. So um, what I thought I might do is talk about um, you know, Black Minds Mattering and the work that I've done on uh, student success, student sense of belonging, but to also do it in a way that I think really builds upon what's taken place in the class so far over the past couple of weeks as I've um, kept up with either the class sessions or the videos. And that is to help us understand uh, where we are in terms of our understanding of black students' experiences in educational spaces. And for me, I see part of my, um, you know, sort of scholarly inquiry, my scholarly interest, my um, curiosity has always been trying to understand uh, what's left to explain. In a, a sort of statistical scenario, it's about the variance explained, what's unexplained by models, what do we not have a firm grasp on, um, what seems to be uncharted or even unterrain uh, yet. So, you know, for me, I think a lot of this goes back to where you began, Luke, a few weeks ago when you were talking to Dr. Frank Harris. I always try to get folks to remember that, you know, students come to higher education, black students, um, Latino students, uh, old students, young students, students straight out of high school, students who delay their um, entry into college, primarily to get a job. And this is not, you know, I've had people say things like, well, that's a very vocational um, perspective on higher education, this idea that students go to college just to get a job. And that's not my point. I'm not trying to argue against the sort of higher order thinking skills that students accrue or, or acquire as a result of a college education. But certainly in my experience through surveys and interviews, I've never met a student who says I want to be a global citizen, but I don't need a job. Um, I want to have really, really strong communication skills and, you know, forget about making a living for myself. The primary motivation for most students going to college is to get a job. And we know a lot about jobs. And I think that the labor market has changed in a way that really gets to um, the essence of what we're talking about in terms of minds mattering and people mattering. So, you know, we have 40 million Americans right now working in jobs that did not exist four years ago. They're you know, many people are Uber drivers and Lyft drivers. They couldn't have done that four years ago. There are folks who graduate from, you know, institutions right now who go on to be senior blog writers or drone pilots. And um, these, you know, as technology has changed the labor market and the kind of jobs that students go on to take, I think it also then pushes those of us in higher education to think more critically about what are the skills then that students need to possess when they graduate in order to be competitive for these jobs. I'm excited to see, um, you know, the kind of out learning outcomes that are shown on the screen, which come out of Forbes magazine, Money magazine, and lots of different courses where employers say to those of us in higher education, look, I need graduates 
who can work well on diverse teams. You know, I need graduates who can make decisions and communicate with people um, effectively and written in written and oral form. Uh, I think that it's very clear that we still need graduates who are proficient users in technology, but I'm also excited to see the idea that uh, employers understand that the world is connected, the labor market is connected, the problems that we face in the workforce are also intersectional and connected such that they need graduates of our institutions who can imagine and create and see connections. I think this is really important for those of us in higher education, especially faculty, because I'm not real sure that the traditional curriculum, the canon, um, provides enough space for students to preserve their creativity, to imagine. This is particularly important when you start to think about young men of color in schools who are often um, labeled very early on in early grades as being troublemakers, those who are disengaged from their own learning, um, quite often who are penalized for doodling or daydreaming. And this is interesting because I think, um, you know, the idea of penalizing a student for what teachers might perceive as daydreaming, although when that same behavior shows up in a body that's not black or brown, this is usually not the conclusion that it's daydreaming. It's, you know, stay on focus or there's encouragement for the student to be to get back engaged, um, which we can come back to how this happens for teachers and their perceptions. But I think, you know, what we ultimately want to do is create an educational system that preserves a degree of that daydreaming, the imagination, imaginative uh, you know, energy of students. And then finally, employers say all the time they want students who can tell good stories and maximize stories, and I'm not sure we do that very well in higher education either. In fact, most institutions, there are 4,200 colleges and universities in the United States, and most of us do not have a major or a minor in storytelling. Students pick up skills about storytelling in some English courses, but this idea of what is it about the college experience that helps students, equips them to tell good stories and learn how to maximize stories. And one that I believe story, a story that students should, you know, sort of be encouraged to tell and should be skilled at telling very well is their own story. Well, for me, a lot of this, you know, students come to college to get a job. We know what kind of skills students need in order to get those jobs when they, upon graduation. And then we know some things about completing college. This is a traditional student retention model, one that Vince Tinto published back in the 70s. Um, this model alone generates thousands and thousands of studies, dissertations, theses. Um, it's very familiar to those of us in higher education. It's the, um, you know, sort of integrationist model of student departure. Vince hypothesized that students enter college with certain um, skills and abilities, traits in place, and, you know, their family background, their individual attributes, and their pre-college schooling all come together to influence their commitments to either the goal of completing college or the institution, staying enrolled in the institution where they um, begin. And then all of this leads uh, sort of over time into meaningful experiences in the academic and social realm of college, what uh, was ultimately called academic and social integration. Then students might recommit to the goal and recommit to their institution and ultimately make a decision about whether or not they would stay. And as a social scientist whose primary academic discipline is higher education, I've always seen myself as playing in this space around student retention, student success with the, you know, I like to say unapologetic focus on students of color and issues of race and how that shapes this experience. But there are a couple of things we've learned. You know, if you take that same model and look at research published in our field, do a sort of um, summary of studies over the course of time, you learn that actually academic integration only accounts for about 25% of all departures. Take 100 kids that drop out of school, only about 25 to 30% of them would leave because of academic integration issues. Either their grades weren't good enough, they weren't meaningfully engaged in their um, classroom experiences and so forth. That is leaving 75% of departures unexplained by that factor. Um, we've learned over time that finances matter and a lot of students of color, their success in college is impacted by whether or not they can afford to stay. So finances matter, although it's not really captured in Vince's original model. Um, and so for me, I think it's always been exciting to think about the fact that some were, you know, upwards of 50% or so of student departures probably attributed to social factors. 
Um, although I do think academic and social are false dichotomies. And in fact, the other, last week I was at the, uh, in California at Mount San Jacinto uh, College giving a talk in a large auditorium. At the back of the room, there were um, fruit, strawberries and watermelon and coffee and cookies. So before I gave my lecture, the students were in the back of the room with me and we were um, socializing and eating. And then a couple minutes after socializing, I went to the front of the room and I gave a lecture. At the end of my lecture, some students went back and got more snacks and more drinks and came to the front and they had questions for me. And it reminded me of something that Liz Witt at the University of Iowa has been remarked as uh, saying years ago, and that is that learning occurs in every nook and cranny of our campus. Because, you know, I stopped for a moment and looked at that auditorium, and I couldn't figure out what's taking place. Is it academic? I mean, I just gave an academic lecture. The students are asking me questions about my lecture, but in many ways, it's also social. Students are engaging one another. There's laughter in the corner. Some students aren't asking me questions about my lecture, but asking me questions about, you know, where am I going in life and what advice do I have for them about, um, you know, achieving their dream. So I think these boxes, these, these theories that we've really depended on over years to really guide what we do with student success have taught us that, um, one, departure is a function of a lot of different factors and that students leave for really not just one category. These categories are connected as well. Sometimes a student might leave because they don't have the financial resources to be engaged in the social life of college campus. And, you know, you take a hundred new baby boys that are born, um, you know, the stats that we all publish in our research look like this visually. You take a hundred new black boys that are born and only 50 of them are estimated to graduate high school. And of the 50 that graduate high school, usually about half of those would begin uh, their post-secondary career at a two-year community college. And you can see how the screen gets very blank or very empty quite quickly. And then most estimates to date suggest that only about 30% of those will actually complete their associate's degree or transfer to a four-year school. And that's about, you know, that leaves half a person. Um, so I think these are really important numbers for us to think about in terms of the um, challenges that black men face in higher education and then ultimately for where I'm going with belonging. You know, if you go back to the same 50 that graduate high school, we often talk about half of them starting their post-secondary career two-year community colleges. But what's also not really well understood is that of the 25 that remain, not all of those are going to go to a four-year school. Um, but if we assume that all four went, uh, all 25 went to a four-year school, most estimates suggest that about two-thirds of them will leave before completing their degree. So, you know, these days I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, with the words of James Baldwin. James Baldwin says that uh, one of the problems for black men in society is that he must exist while watching the bodies of his same race male peers pile up around him the carnage of them pile up around him. And metaphorically and visually, I, I think about that in higher education. Imagine the guys that make it to college, make it through college, watching so many of their friends get lost in the pipeline. Um, and we, we don't talk enough about survivor guilt for black men in higher education, but we certainly should. Um, and the other thing we learn about models like the one I showed you earlier that's on the screen is that from my research over the past few years um, since being a professor is I've learned that students just don't live in boxes like that. Their lives are intersectional. And intersectionality to me is not um, a buzzword. It is a useful construct for calling attention to the ways in which social identities, which are many for all students, intersect with one another and operate within this larger apparatus of power and oppression that advantages some people and disadvantages others. Um, I think that, you know, that's a useful tool for helping me understand, try to, you know, how to tease out some of these experiences that black men face in, in college. So over the past, what, year or so, I, I've seen myself uh, arguing for this sort of paradigm shift where, uh, you know, I used to avoid this term because I would hear people use the term paradigm shift as if they were going to say something really, really remarkable. And then they would follow it up with something that was pretty ordinary. And that always left me wanting for more. So I, I try to get away from this term. But I actually think that um, this, which we're talking about in this class, 
would represent a paradigm shift. That is, I was on a campus one time and the, the campus's uh, name or identity is less relevant to the story, but um, they gave me some pre-reading before I came to visit. And one thing they told me about this campus is that they are a student-centered campus. And I thought, okay, student-centered campus, this is great. Um, doesn't every campus want to be student-centered? And while walking across campus buying coffee or something like this, I went pot by a park parking lot. I remember there being, I don't know, like two dozen parking spaces devoted, you know, they said reserved, and there were names on them. And for whatever reason, they were all together. They caught my attention. I walked over to these, these parking spaces and, and saw that every single parking space, 25, 27 of them, were reserved for senior level administrators. And I thought about it when I got back to my hotel room. Wow. The student-centered campus and every single reserved parking space is for an administrator. Why couldn't one be reserved for a student? How much would parking cost on a truly student-centered campus for students? And what are the other ways in which, if we were truly student-centered, I always think about this, like, and I've, and I've had some success here, so I love telling this, um, this idea, you know, if you look at most curriculum committees at universities, they're made up of deans and faculty and um, those types. We have student reps on the board of visitors and the board of trustees, but rarely do we have a student who is a representative on the curriculum committee. Why wouldn't students have input into the curriculum that they would then study as part of their degree? Student centered to me is like really focusing on the strengths that students bring versus trying to figure out what their weaknesses are and how we can deal with those. It really focuses on their needs versus the, not that they're not the things that they don't have in place, but what is it that students need in order to be successful? What is our understanding of that? And then what are we doing as an institution to really provide the support that students need? And finally, really focusing on success over access. A lot of what we do in higher education when it comes to black men, especially men of color, really focuses on access. How can we get them in the door? I think any enrollment strategy that focuses on access is short-sighted. It's going to cause challenges in the future when you get students into campus, um, but can't really get them to graduate. So, you know, what's the point of, you know, I would say access uh, without success is useless. That's borrowing words from Vince Tinto. And um, I think that's critically, uh, that's so true, that the point of getting students into higher education is for them to be successful. And when it comes to needs and success, it's really been my work on um, student sense of belonging that has really helped me here. And I think a lot of it causes me to focus on trying to really get the work together um, to understand student success. Before I go into belonging, though, I just want to highlight a couple of things that have been talked about in previous classes. You know, you talk about unexplained variants. Why aren't black men um, being successful? Or the flip is those black men who are successful, what do they benefit from? Teacher expectations is really important. I love the fact that Dr. Griffin uh, alluded to this a bit earlier, too. Um, you know, in 2008, I did this analysis looking at urban men in schools and found that a larger proportion of teachers would make recommendations for black men to go to work, not college, while they would tell other students to go to college, not work. The, the findings even more significant when you start to control for academic preparation and academic success. Why is it that teachers would tell highly successful, academically successful black men, go to work and not college? Um, and I think, you know, it has a lot to do with their expectations of these students. It has a lot to do with, um, you know, the power that educators have in terms of creating uh, trajectories for students and as you were saying earlier the, the 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 power that teachers have to really help students move on to higher education and move through it um, you know I was surprised that about a quarter of black men in that study reported that they have actually been put down or unsupported by their teachers and you know every now and again I, you may have this experience too uh, Dr. Wood when I'm conducting analysis and writing it up it's the moment where my research becomes almost like autobiography because growing up in Virginia Beach, Virginia, I went to really wonderful schools, and I think I benefited from really um, qualified and great teachers. But there were times where I remember teachers saying to me, you're really, really good at math. You should be a banker, you know, or, um, oh my gosh, you are really, really good at science. Have you ever thought about working in a museum? Not 
have you ever thought about being an engineer, going to college and majoring in science? And then there are certainly times where I felt like I was not supported by my teachers where my um, non-black peers were. You know, and then there are other, you know, things that we found about the role that parents play and that teachers play, again, re revealing this sort of intersectional um, confluence of factors that really impact black men's success. One of the things that looking back at these, these publications that I published in the past with new set of eyes, I have more, I have different questions, you know. So in this, this analysis, I found that um, parents' level of education and their involvement in their students' education influences whether or not the student will um, excel in school, especially for black, these are black men. And now the question is like, okay, so that's the, that's the st statistical relationship. That's the interpretation of my regression model. But now the equity question is, is that equitable? That a student's achievement in math depends in part on their parents' level of education and the extent to which their mom or dad can be involved in their education, checking homework and um, so forth. And I think these are big questions for us to really think about. Um, and, and one that I haven't, uh, haven't really finished uh, wrapping my mind around. You know, again, a lot of the work really led me to, oops, sorry, led me to my work on belonging, <clears throat> which I think is the, the crux of a lot of my insights about student success. I wrote this book back in 2012, as I mentioned. Um, the second edition is coming out this next year. And I ground my work on belonging and Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow says that as humans, we all have basic needs like air, water, food, shelter, sleep, and sex. And once these physiological needs are met, higher order needs um, emerge. Now, the pyramid in the, in the middle is Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs that many people will be familiar with. All the uh, information superimposed on it is like Strayhorn meets Maslow. It's what I'm trying to come together as a sort of framework for this. And I think if you can appreciate the fact that the apex at the top, the red triangle, really reflects our educational mission. Higher education exists to produce creative and innovative, self-authored, moral, spontaneous, uh, active participants in democracy, Think, learned thinkers. Um, what this essentially says is that we'll never fulfill our educational mission until we can move from basic physiological needs through what lies right in the center, that's love and belongingness, ultimately to help students achieve these higher order needs. And that's why I think sense of belonging is so critically important, even for black men. It refers to a feeling that people matter to one another. I've often said that it's uh, about a shared faith. You know, students come to higher education, parents bring their, their, their students to higher education, and they believe us that their needs will be met um, through their commitment to be together. And a lot of this, you know, um, is grounded in work that is not, um, you know, that's been around for some time. It was Sylvia Hurtado and uh, Deb Faye Carter back in the 90s who wrote a piece about sense of belonging. Actually, they were looking at um, Latino students' sense of belonging and said that belonging has cognitive, affective, and behavioral um, components to it. Now, I've said that a billion times, but what that really means is sense of belonging is about mattering, but it's also, first of all, it starts in the mind. That's why I think it's central to this class. Black minds matter. So much happens mm -hmm. cognitively in the mind. And what happens in the mind influences how we feel, the meaning that we make of certain moments. And that then has a direct impact on the behaviors, things that we do. When students think that they belong, they start to feel like they belong. And it's through these, the thoughts and the feelings of belonging that they ultimately start to do things or act in ways that suggest they belong. They belong. And it's connected to uh, mattering, which, you know, Nancy Sloshberg spent a lot of time thinking about uh, mattering. Mattering has four components to it. By the way, I have that T-shirt. I love wearing that. I was going to wear it tonight, but you wouldn't be able to see it because I'm too short. Um, but there are four components to mattering, importance, dependence, ego extension and attention. Importance is the idea that, um, you know, students feel like they matter when they feel like they are important to us. They are more than just a number. Um, secondly, they feel like they matter when they feel a sense of dependence. Someone needs me. I play an important role. Ego extension refers to this idea that I experience myself in someone else. My good days are their good days. My bad days are their bad days. Um, and students also feel like they experience mattering when um, they have our attention. When it comes to black men, 
black men who feel a sense of belonging in higher education in my research perform better, have higher grades, higher retention rates, higher persistence rates. They go on to graduate at higher rates. They ultimately become um, much more engaged alumni of the institution as well. And it's only when black men experience all four of these dimensions, they start to feel like they matter, ultimately belong and lead to success. Um, we can come back to that during the Q&A. And I think, you know, people ask me all the time, like, what can we do as an institution to help students feel a sense of belonging? Um, and I've worked with campuses. Kent State is one that I've worked with in the past on some consulting and um, worked with them. So this idea that, you know, you can tell students that they belong. Signs like this can be affected, but it's more than signs. I mean, hanging a sign up um, is not the only way to, to get a, to help a student feel a sense of belonging. Um, because what the sign has to reflect is an experience that students will be connected with the support, supported faculty, see themselves reflected in the curriculum and on campus in ways that also engender this idea that I, I belong, I matter. Um, I've seen lots of websites like these where campuses use this message of you belong here to compel students to apply, to enroll and even to the point where they use it, even in specific majors at some schools, to say to students who don't show up in those majors in large numbers, or say in certain sub-disciplines like opera, that hey, you, this is for you. And I think what it happens is, if you go back to what we've been talking about, it sends a message that is, first of all, received cognitively. The student struggles with it, okay? I've not seen myself in that major before. I've not thought about going on to be a scientist or an engineer. But now I see a message that says, I could be this. I have an image of a person who looks like me in this role. Before you know it, that creates that cognitive dissonance that's necessary for learning to occur. And as students are wrestling with this inconsistent message, I, I'm not seeing myself in this field, but now I'm seeing a message I'm in this field. Oh my gosh, maybe I could be in this field. It starts to feel effectively like I could belong here. And then hopefully they have positive experiences, whether that's through their mentors, through um, pre-college programs, sometimes through, um, you know, this campus visits that really affirm for them, like, you know, this is a place for me. People like me can be successful here that ultimately lead them to either enroll or to, as you were talking about earlier, Luke, exercise the effort that's necessary to be successful in college and then to find success. Um, and then finally, I talk to faculty a lot about, like, what they can do in the classroom. You know, I tell them things like it starts with learning students' names. It doesn't stop there. But that's important. Learning students' names, especially for ethnic minority students, is good to know their names and know how to say it the right way. You know, I'm all, I always remember smiling in grade school and middle school and high school when a teacher called me Terrell, not Tyrell or Terrence or Juan, you know, all of these names that are not mine. Uh, so with the moment that we understand that it's difficult to feel a sense of belonging in a place where no one knows your name or no one knows your correct name. And I think this opens up a lot of opportunity. But even after that, um, really helping students fight, you know, by the time black men get into higher education, they've received a lot of messages um, about whether or not they can do this, whether or not they are college material, whether or not they can belong. And they, they actually arrive, at least in my estimation, um, with many more messages that they don't belong in college than positive message that affirm that. We as educators can help them. There's something in social psychology called rewriting negative scripts. And the steps are shown on the screen where, first of all, you help them know the negative script. Things like people like me don't belong here. Um, I'm never going to do this. People, like, people from my neighborhood don't go to college. Identify what that negative script is and then help them identify that mistaken belief. Usually the mistaken belief is either that the, the student is taking the moment and making it monumentous or taking the unit and making it universal. So yeah, maybe not everybody in your neighborhood um, it goes to college, but actually no one from every neighborhood goes to college. You know? So I think just normalizing some of these expectations, helping them understand you may be the first in your college to go to, your first in your family to go to college, you won't be the last, but to identify that mistaken belief and then tag that unmet need so they can then help rewrite it into a positive script of, you know what, maybe people um, from my neighborhood have not gone to college, but I'm going to go to college now. I'm going to be successful when I do X, Y, and Z. So there I'll stop and then entertain any questions, thoughts, reactions um, to some of the things we talked about. Well, well, first, let's go ahead and give Dr. Strayhorn a round of applause for the incre those incredible remarks. 
so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Strayhorn. Those are just uh, amazing. Um, and so what we're going to be doing, uh, Karan, if you can go ahead and put this back up for a few moments, is you'll see his uh, Twitter handles on this slide there, at TLS Strayhorn, at TLS, uh, TL Strayhorn, at TL Strayhorn. You can post questions to, um, to Twitter. You can send them to me directly, or you can pose them to Dr. Strayhorn yourself. First question. So the question is actually asking this, I don't know if you had a chance to, send, to hear Dr. Griffin's remarks. Yes. Okay, you did. Um, so she talked about this concept of other mothering. And so this uh, question comes from uh, Stacy uh, Teeters, who's a student in this class, and says, um, how can or do other mothers affect students' sense of belonging? Do you, has there any research been done on that? I don't know. Other mothers affect, affect students' sense of belonging. Um, I haven't seen where there's been an enormous amount of work. So here's what I can say to it. You know, I've used the other mothering framework in a couple of times. One uh, place where I used it was a few years ago, I did some work with Joan Hurt, um, then at Virginia Tech, and a group of folks to look at um, student affairs administrators at historically black colleges. Student affairs administrators at historically black colleges often describe themselves and their roles as like uh, acting as surrogate parents to students and um, going beyond the call of duty um, to meet students' basic needs. To me, if you can appreciate that sense of belonging is one of those basic needs and that one way in which you can start to feel a sense of belonging is to see yourself reflected in the educational context, educational environment. In fact, I was on a campus, I think in, the, in Memphis one time, giving a lecture and I talked about seeing yourself reflected in the curriculum, seeing yourself reflected in the videos that are shown in the classroom. And at the end, a young woman who's a student there raised her hand and said, Dr. Strayhorn, you forgot the most important place where I wanna see myself. And I said, where's that? She said, at the front of the room as the professor. Um, and, and she helps us understand that increasing faculty diversity, what Dr. Griffin was talking about is critically important. So, to the extent that faculty and staff, student affairs administrators and academic affairs administrators can um, act as other mothers to students, to go beyond the call of duty, to help meet their basic needs, to be there as counselors, as mentors, um, to make time for them, to help them feel like they matter. I think that yes, you can help them also feel a sense of belonging. One, I think that uh, educators do a, a, a large, a large part of the um, heavy lifting when it comes to uh, helping students feel like they matter. You know, telling them that they can do it, affirming their capability, their abilities, all of those are things that I think ultimately indirectly influence belonging. Absolutely, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, have you? found campuses that do a particularly good job? And what separates some of those campuses from maybe those that aren't doing a really good job around this? Is it just desire? I mean, I think that it certainly starts with the will. <laughs> you know, I, I once worked with the provost uh, at uh, the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, who was very good at telling folks, you know, because people will get around the proverbial table and say things like, well, there just aren't enough students of color out there. There just aren't enough faculty of color out there. Um, it's gonna take too much money and too much time. And he would be quick to remind us that, you know, a lot of this starts with a will. And we can get resources. We can create more time um, within our schedules to discuss something. But what you, what's hard to manufacture is a will to want to address campus climate. You have to accept that, um, you know, go back to the model I was talking about earlier, part of student departure so much of what we do in higher education research says that, you know, student departure, the causes for student departure lie within the student. It's their, um, you know, their lack of academic preparation, their lack of financial resources. They're not putting forth the effort. They're not studying hard or establishing relationships with faculty. And while all those factors are undeniably important and true, there are more systemic and systematic factors that also deserve um, attention. Some students, you know, said directly, some students drop out of college because our institutions are racist. 
Some black men drop out of college because they are in classrooms with faculty who do not know how to look at them as capable learners. Some black men drop out of college because they're exhausted. They're, they get tired of these hostile, unwelcoming environments that as Dr. Griffin was talking about, exhaust them. All of that energy directed toward what are people thinking of me and what are their expectations of me and you know, am I, do I look the right way? Am I sitting the right way? Does that make sense to anybody? That is exhausting and it drains on the psychological and emotional um, resources of a student who's left with very little and then drops out. So I think that these are really important. The campuses that I've seen, I mean, there's no one that I'm gonna hold up and say, hey, here's the model. What I am excited about are there are campuses, like I said, um, and highlighted, Kent State's one that's been working a lot on sense of belonging for students of color. I've seen and worked with Colgate University where sense of belonging is a theme in their strategic plan. They're really trying to figure out what can we do across the board, not one program or one speaker. How can we start to build a curriculum, diversify the faculty, you know, change the campus um, layout so that ultimately the message is sent and received that all students belong here and can be successful. And I think when institutions adopt strategies that are multifaceted like that, looking at curriculum, faculty diversity, student diversity, student support services that are critical to have in place, um, certainly the financial resources the students need to be successful. When you start bringing all those threads together, that's a place that has promising potential to me. Okay, next question comes from B.L. Howard. It says, Dr. Storyhorn, how can local mentoring programs help to change the narrative of, for our black students? Local mentoring programs, is that what that said? Yes. Yeah, you know, I think there's a, a lot that can be done. You know, mentoring is important, and I've had, um, I've given a lot of thought to the role of mentoring over some time. I once estimated how many mentoring programs I think I, I have benefited from, and I use it facetiously to say that I think, if I'm not mistaken, I've probably been a part of something like 30 mentoring programs, which means that I've been assigned, um, you know, some 30 mentors. These are not the mentors that I, I have that I selected on my own. And in a way, you know, I think about this in a medical uh, scenario, medical metaphor, if mentoring is an educational intervention, something that we offer students that should help them succeed, Exactly how many mentoring programs should a student get or need in order to reach their objectives that they set for themselves, the goals that they've set for themselves? It seems to me that 30 mentoring programs is a lot and that, um, I don't know, after 30 mentoring programs, I should be taller or something as a result of all of the good mentoring that I receive. So it suggests that there might be a problem with mentoring, and there is. This is the problem with mentoring, and this is the implication for the question. One, I think that mentoring, you know, I've done work on mentoring. Uh, mentoring can work, but a lot of mentoring research suggests that it doesn't, and it's not because mentoring as a concept doesn't work, it's mentoring the way that we create it in education doesn't work. You know, it operates on this assumption that anyone can help young people. And I simply, I mean, if you listen to the course over the past couple of weeks, you, hopefully you walk away understanding that, um, one, let's just be real, everyone doesn't want to help young men of color. Secondly, everyone doesn't have the cultural competence and the understanding, the high expectations, the high belief in the capability of young men to be able to help um, black students. So I think, and this, and this happens in mentoring programs, because you know what, I, about a year ago, I was looking in, into mentoring programs, and maybe two dozen or so that I was just sort of polling, not a single one said that they screened their mentors. All of them require the protégés to apply and some screening of them, but rarely do we ever screen the mentors. So now the question is, if you were going to screen mentors, what would you screen them for? What are the skills and traits that an individual must demonstrate they possess, have demonstrated evidence of in order to be an effective mentor of men of color, of, of students of color? You know, um, there are... Uh, we've had this whole movement around implicit bias. There are lots of mentors who can't help students of color because of their own implicit bias, which never gets screened in these in the creation of these programs. So I think local programs can do a better job of identifying mentors who really want to help students, um, do a better job of screening out those mentors. Usually you can be a mentor so long as you have a pulse. Um, I think that the qualification should be a bit higher. 
than that. You know, there should be some evidence that one would amass and demonstrate. You know, for instance, um, you think about applying for a job in higher education. Quite often you have to demonstrate that you have research expertise and that's demonstrated through publications and there's some teaching experience and quite often that's through your teaching evaluations and that you understand the professional acumen and so you've been involved in professional service. What are those same qualifications we would expect of mentors? What evidence do they have that they um, inspire young people, that they have high expectations of young people and know how to communicate that well? Um, what This is one that I think mentors must have. What evidence do you have that the mentor knows how to listen actively and reserve judgment? So many mentors talk, 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 and never listen to the protege. So I think there are things that they can do um, there. And then the most important, finally, is, you know, mentoring should be intrusive. I tell proteges and mentors, whoever I can all the time, that if you're in a mentoring relationship where it's all, you know, fun and games and you're never asked to do something that you're not sure um, you want to do or you, you can do. Um, I, I think that's a mentoring relationship that needs a little push, that students benefit when mentors ask them to step into unknown spaces and provide the support for them to be successful then. You know, introduce them to people who they do not know, but provide the language for starting those conversations. Uh, certainly encourage them or nominate them for leadership opportunities, but then provide the support and the training for them to be effective there. That, to me, is what mentoring done well looks like. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take uh, this, this one last question, um, given that we're at, at time for the evening. Uh, and this one comes from uh, Kerry Johnson. It says, Dr. Strayhorn is breaking down the incredible impact of sense of belonging on college campuses for black males. How loud does this message have to be to overwrite 18 plus years of the opposite message? And what happens outside the box they don't live in? outside the box they don't live in? Yeah, I'm not sure about the second part, but, how, but I think that first part, how, um, how loud does the message have to be to override 18 plus years of the opposite message? Yeah, and could you read that second part one more time? Um, it says, and what happens outside the box they don't live in? Yeah, so my guess is that she's going back to that slide where I said, you know, the thing we've learned is that students don't live in these boxes and what else happens? So let me just, plop a couple of thoughts here to share and then um, we can be we can wrap up for your next segment and that is you know I think you've captured it that it clearly has to um, this message you belong here especially in college has to ring loudly I mean remarkably loudly to not only overcome 18 years of messages that you don't belong here. Um, and that is, we've known from decades upon decades of research, you know, young black men are starting to read, on average, read behind grade level um, by the fourth grade. And those reading gaps only accumulate over time. And then there are other challenges because once you are, you know, reading behind grade level, um, there's teasing that you might experience in school. There's also other learning opportunities that you won't be able to access because you, so much of your time in school is really devoted to trying to fill this gap and get your literacy skills up that you can't. And, and, and there's so much focus on the lack or gap with literacy that sometimes we miss the enormous success and skills with numeracy and other areas, mastery, where black men might possess it. So I think that um, it has to ring loudly that they, and it cannot be, you know, although a lot of my work really focuses on working with two-year and four-year college campuses, this message, you belong here, has to happen before um, they get to college. The other thing is that there are messages in society about black men not belonging, not just in school, but belonging in the world. And I think a lot of that requires us to make sure that very early on, um, we're sending this message that you can be successful successful, school is for you, um, you have what it takes. I was in the airport, Chicago O'Hare Airport one time, saw a sign, I actually was going to put it in my PowerPoint uh, for this evening, but um, it was this African-American male with uh, natural sort of twisted hair, and the message said something like, um, you can be successful here. 
But if you look closely, it's actually an ad about a learning center for students with learning disabilities or learning um, deficits. So it's a great image of a guy. He looks great. And the message like you can be successful is a positive spin on it. But when you look at the details of it, it actually is simply perpetuating the same um, idea, the same message that if you're going to be successful, you're going to be successful in these kind of settings, these kind of places. You know, that's just walking in Chicago O'Hare. So I was wondering, like, where do kids get this message that they don't belong, they can't succeed? You can pick it up in the airport. Um, you can pick it up in the grocery store. So the message has to be loud. It has to be consistent. It has to start early. It's not just the parent's responsibility or the garden's respo guardian's responsibility. I think it takes, it really does take a village to um, help cultivate the academic abilities and gifts of young men of color. And to the point about the box, you know, there's a lot that happens outside the box. Um, the box says that it's academic, social, and financial, which, you know, says nothing about the spirit, the animating force within young men. I think if I have any concern at all, and I have lots of them, one is that so much of what happens in society, whether it's the, aim, the senseless killing of black men by police officers, um, whether it's the um, treatment of black male visible leaders, um, is that the message that is received and internalized by young black men is that one, I don't matter. I could be gunned down tomorrow. So my life, you know, I, I literally, Luke, had a young man on the plane sitting beside me who said to me, man, that's crazy. Why would you want me to go to college? College is like four or five years. What if I don't live that long? And yeah. it was one of those moments where it just hit me. You know, when you start back to, I close where I began, you know, back to um, James Baldwin who talks about young black men having to persist in the world while they watch the carnage of their peers pile up around them. Um, it's hard to cash in on the value of college education, give it four or five, maybe six years, when you're not even sure your life will last that long. And I think all of that, what happens in society, the stereotypes and the media messages, the senseless killing by cops, the um, black on black crime, all of that is what happens outside the box over which our theories have little to say and, and even less control. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. It reminds me of a, the time, oh, actually the very first study I ever did. I, I interviewed black males who were in a community college and uh, the very last interview I did was with a, um, a student who had talked about some of the external challenges that he was facing and I asked him at the very end, you know, you know, I said to him, thank you for doing the interview, and I asked him why he did it. Um, and, you know, some students would say, you know, I did it for the cash, or I just wanted to talk to you, or whatever it might be, different reasons. And he said to me, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be on the surface. So I just wanted to have, this, I just wanted to know that someone had a record of my life. Yeah. So it very much mirrors this, the same mm -hmm. type of, of message that you received as well. And that's, you know, that's unfortunately what our society has produced. Yeah. So it speaks to the, the importance of the message that you've been going around the, this country and delivering about belonging, about how we can create, create climates and culture where people matter. So just really appreciative of, of the work that you're doing and for, for being a light. Thank you. My pleasure. You know, what you just said is catch encapsulate so much of, you know, I was giving a talk in um, somewhere just recently, <laughs> New Orleans. And at the end, this woman came up and she said, you know, part of what I got from your talk is that it just brings humanity back to what we're doing. You know, people matter. Black minds matter. And I was looking at the videos that you did uh, at the beginning of the class with folks. You know, I think Black minds matter because black lives matter. And minds don't exist. They don't walk around on their own. Minds are captured in bodies. And those bodies matter. And mattering, to me, is a component of belonging. So those, those bodies, black bodies, have to belong. And they don't just belong. You know, the, I, the whole idea of a critical perspective on belonging, which I've not done, uh, I've not written yet, but a critical perspective that really centers race and power. You know, this idea that 
people get to decide where bodies belong. The idea that someone could say to a young black male, you don't belong in college, whether they say it directly or indirectly, is power that needs to be controlled, it needs to be um, put back into its place because we don't get to determine where each other belong. But the fact that there are black men in college who do not feel like they belong, their bodies are there and their minds are there, mean that we have to do a better job of creating environments that really start to affirm their humanity, letting them know we see them, they're visible, they are not um, invisible, and that more important, their contributions matter and that with support and with um, you know, our own our help, they can be successful. The purpose of going to college, I think college still pays off, it's still worth going to, um, but ultimately it takes all of us really starting to um, want to get to the point where we return back to the humanity of it all. Students are people and people matter. And retention work, the boxes that, we, that the student was talking about, sometimes those boxes dehumanize us. And we start to be, you know, dots on a chart. I mean, and I'm guilty of it too. Over the years, I've seen graphs that start to look like numbers and bar charts and, and circles. But I'm really trying to remind myself that this chart relates to people. And at the end of this, there are young men who went to college hoping they could get a degree who don't get to hold it in their hands. They don't get to take it home to their mom and their grandma like I got to do. And part of this work is to make sure that we can open up access and make it more equitable so that many more who are deserving get to do that. Thank you, Dr. Strayhorn, for, for joining us, Terrell. I truly appreciate it and uh, look forward to seeing you soon and to getting a copy of the second edition of College mm -hmm. and Students Blogging. Thank you, my pleasure. Thanks for the great work you're doing. Have a good night. Okay, so at this point, um, we're going to go ahead and close for the evening. And as we do, I just want to um, just point out some of the amazing things that were said by our guest speakers. For Dr. Griffin, she highlighted uh, four important um, aspects of that create strain in our college campuses, persistent underrepresentation, poor cross-cultural relations, cross-racial relations, structural concerns, and environmental pressures. She said that structures and policies and, and programs will require people who are truly committed to this work. Um, and she also mentioned that we have to make sure that our colleagues are recognized for their heavy lifting and talking about the extra taxation for our faculty of color. Uh, for Dr. Strayhorn uh, as well also mentioned many great things. He says, are we penalizing students for daydreaming and talk about the importance of being able to tell stories? And he talked about this importance of knowing that our academic and social aspects shouldn't be considered in isolation as a false dichotomy between the two. Um, he also uh, mentioned that access without success is useless and that there's a need for us to know the scripts, identify the scripts, and change them when we're talking about our black boys and our black men. Lastly, I would like to just remind us that we will be back here next Monday and we have three guest speakers who will be joining us um, in a guest interview with Dr. Jawanza Kanjufu, who really was one of the first scholars to create this field of black male studies. Uh, Dr. Chance Lewis, who is a professor at UNC Charlotte, who is an amazing individual who's done incredible research, one of the most prolific scholars on this topic, and really focuses on what are some practices that actually work. And then lastly, um, our guest speaker will be Ilyasa Shabazz, who is the daughter of Malcolm X and uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz. And so she'll be sharing her perspectives as, as an educational advocate. So we hope that you will be joining us then and have a great rest of your evening. And remember that black minds do indeed matter. Thank you. <laughs>